YouTube. Welcome to Cauldron Talk. I am Shannon K. O'Brien. I am an aspiring author. I am currently represented by Shannon Snow at Creative Media Agency. Um, and with me today is the lovely, the articulate, the very handsome. Take it away. Gabe Rodriguez, filmmaker and nerd, and I think I just spilled a little bit of cauldron uh, onto myself during that introduction, <laughs> but cheers, cauldron talk. Cheers. I do not have a cauldron, but I have a personalized tumbler that my friend Desiree made me for my Atlantis series. And for anyone who knows me, just the glitter alone that the pyramids are gold glitter says everything. So thank you, Desiree. I use this every day and I love it every time I use it. And I just want to say as someone who only saw that like a few minutes before we started filming, that looks amazing just on its own. It's an amazing work of art and it does capture uh, Shannon's series, which I've read in manuscript form. So great job to Desiree. Yes. Yeah, she did a great job. Like everything about that is just like, because I remember her asking me and I didn't know why she asked me. She's like, what, did, how did you see the uh, cover for the book again, if you had any say in it? And I was like, oh, I see it with like, you know, purples and pinks, like a sunrise or a sunset. And she was like, okay. And I didn't know where she was going with it, but this is where she was going with it. So yeah, it was perfect. All right, you guys. So we have finished book two and we are now here to talk all things Akamath. And on that note, Gabe, thoughts on the second half of Akamath and go. <laughs> okay, so uh, full spoilers, uh, adult language between the two of us. Absolutely, yeah, thank you for that because I would have had to put up another little disclaimer, but yeah. So uh, this is actually Shannon's first time hearing my thoughts uh, since I finished it a few days ago. Um, overall, I, I like Akamath more than Akatar. I feel, though, that this book, um, it feels more like a season of television than it does uh, one novel because it, a lot of things happen and it's a little bit episodic. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what kind of reader you are. But yeah. I definitely did feel like, um, just as a whole, the book begins, um, immediately we establish that Feyre is now with Reese, and the love triangle is seemingly resolved within the first third or so of the book, and then Reese is, yeah. is just the, the permanent love interest. And then it, uh, I, I think this is a video game term, but it's, it becomes like a, a series of fetch quests. Quest, uh, fetch quests. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a really good analogy. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So it's, mm -hmm. okay, our mission now is uh, we, uh, this cauldron, but also we have to get this book, and we get have to get half of the book, and we have to do this. Um, and it did feel, as I was reading the book, and more so in the second half of the book, where it was um, this little mini episode, then stop, and characters would have a little back and forth, then another mini episode, then stop. And because of that, um, I, I did feel a little bit like the plot moved a bit in fits and starts. And I did feel like when I finished the book, the way I would feel after a season of TV where instead of talking about the book as a whole, I would talk about, well, I liked this little episode and I like this little episode. I know what you're saying. Yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying. It was like this book had, um, it almost had several climaxes, right? Like rising and falling and rising and falling. And um, I actually wonder now that I'm, th I'm, I'm just looking at it across from me, but uh, my favorite author, uh, Diana Gabaldon, who writes Outlander, she has mentioned, she has said how all of her books have like a shape to it and um, how the first Outlander book is like three uh, triangles because there is rising action, climax, falling, rising, climax, three of them throughout this huge book. I mean, Outlander is almost a thousand pages, I think. So it is very large and the first book is the shortest of all mm -hmm. of them um but and i know mass is a huge outlander fan as well so i wonder if like you know because it, it does have a similar feel to it where yes we have this uh 
I, again, I want to say climax. It's not really a climax, but this height of what's going on. And then we kind of get a breathing moment where we can just chill and then something else happens. And yes, um, I will say that when I read this for the first time though, um, not this time, but the first time I was like a little, I don't even want to say that annoyed isn't the right word, but just kind of like, oh man, like we're back at the townhouse. Yes. Like, can we, can we keep going? Cause like, what we just went through was great. Like, can we have more of that please? Um, but this time around, like, I just enjoyed it all around because I already knew where it was going. I knew those big moments. Um, so I was able to appreciate all of those breathing moments in between, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I, I think, um, like if you ask me about little moments in Akamath, I, I would be like, yeah, I remember when that happened. I remember when that happened, but I don't remember the exact sequence that they happened. And it isn't like another book where you feel, okay, that plot point led to that plot point led to that, which led directly into the climax. Yes, I, I, I agree. Um, I will say, okay, that the one thing when I read this for the first time that I was, the only thing probably that I, I, I got right in the entire series that I had pre-guessed from the end of book one was at the end of book one when he stumbles back and he disappears. I was like, oh man, they're mates. They're mates, aren't they? And so when I started book two, like that was my driving force to keep, I was like, why isn't anybody mentioning this? Like, how come, maybe I'm wrong. And I'm like, I mean, I got, you know, cause it doesn't come out until the last yeah. like, third of the book. I think maybe that, less even. Yeah. That by that point I was like, oh, I, I so got this wrong. Like that's not the case at all. So maybe this is a stupid question. Were mates mentioned that much in book one? They, they were mentioned, but it was enough for me. And maybe this is because like, um, I'm not a huge reader of like high fantasy. Usually it's magical realism where it's like set in our worlds, but like, you know, like Harry Potter, right? Where okay. we've got the muggles and, but, but it's our world. It's really London. Mm -hmm. and yeah. There's magic and stuff. This was like, you know, a whole nother world and my first foray into fairies and stuff because I just wasn't like into it. Um, <laughs> so that to me stuck out but more so because I had just written I had started my magical realism um Phantom of the Opera retelling and I finished the first book and I had started my second one and you read it you read Magic of the Night I, Gabe I I don't have mates in it I, but I have that soul bond I was gonna say I believe Magic of the Night is the first of your manuscripts that I ever read and yeah I think I read it I did I know that it was a phantom retelling when I went in um yeah uh, that's how I pitched it to you <laughs> okay uh, phantom of the opera kind of meets beauty and the beast but it really did it had just slight beauty and the beast elements to it uh with the curse and stuff like that but that but, that's why I think it stuck with me was and I recommend I music of the night to to all readers out there someday we don't want to plagiarize Andrew Lloyd Webber, I did not name my title. Oh, my Magic of the Night. Music of the Night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get sued. <laughs> no, no, but um, I'd still do it. I will call it Music of the Night, so you're not alone. But um, yeah, that's, I think, why it probably stuck with me. Um, however, once again, I told you, like, Desiree, she got the riddle and stuff in the first book. And <clears throat> as soon as she was done now, that, now again, that's why the mate thing kind of stuck with me. I was like, Oh, they, they have like mates and like they're bonded and stuff. And you know, of course, right away, my brain started spiraling. I'm like, Oh my God, does that mean I can't do what I already did in my book? And, but when Desiree got to the end of the first book, she poloed me and she's like, they're mates, aren't they? So I think it just depends on like the, you know, the way your brain works. I'm not going to sit here and say, I think I would have for a minute gotten it if my brain hadn't been so consumed by the fact that, man, shit, I did something similar. Is it okay that I did something similar? Like I already wrote the whole fucking book. Like, what am I going to do now? No, but you're good. And that's part of the overlap that happens in, in any fantasy or any, um, any storytelling that's going to cover similar beats. 
Well, like I said to you, Car my friend Carrie reads fantasy up the yin yang. That's her preferred genre. And she said to me, she's like, nothing's original. You, yeah. you got to you do it in your own way, and you know you are good. But still, like, I'm weird. I would never care if somebody like copied one of my books. I, you know, I would consider that's like that's flattery. Like you liked it that much. Yeah. But, but I don't ever want to copy somebody so i know that makes no sense but like i don't i want it like so there were a couple of things in my series that i was really proud that i was like oh, this is original and i no <laughs> it's not uh so um i guess getting back to akamath um uh yes i enjoyed it uh i i guess i feel it was uh a little bit more of a challenging read than book one and as a whole, the series has just gone in such a different direction that these these two books really feel almost like night and day. Um, Absolutely. And I'm curious, uh, may, maybe book three will will unify the two a little more. Book three is a bookend to book two, so every all the vibes that you got in book two, it's you're going to have the same ones honestly throughout the rest of the series. Book one is the odd man out. Book one is the one that it's like, okay, well, I like when you read, you know, at least three quarters of the way in or a third, you know, I don't know, two thirds yeah. of the way in, you're like, this is what I, you know, this is what I kind of expected. Beauty and yeah. Beast sort of retelling. And then it's like, wait, what? Um, the rest of the series is the wait, what? That That's just, that's what you'll get. Um, and that's why, like I said to you, when you were reading book one, you were like, kind of like, eh, I'm like, just hold on. I'm telling you, yeah. it's going to be something else entirely. So no, what you've got with book two, um, you'll get with book three. And, um, I'm trying to think like, it's been a while since I, I, you know, I read book three, but I, you know, there are a ton of things kind of like episodic, like you were saying that like that happen. But I also remember there, I mean, I, I wasn't aggravated when we would get to a breathing point. And I think that's simply because like, you need the breathing point at that. Okay. Point. There's so much going, like you need the minute to just, okay, like can we, everybody's alive. Everybody's good. Okay. <laughs> like, let's just enjoy this for a minute. Um, because like the shit's still hitting the fan and it's going to keep hitting the fan. <clears throat> so, excuse me. Um, I will say I was expecting like towards the end of, sorry, my brain's ping pong here, the end of Akamath. Um, I was expecting like Tamlin to do something stupid mm -hmm. after Lucian showed up. But I was not expecting stupid on that level. No, neither was I. I mean, it it did feel like uh, Tamlin was retconned into a villain when he hadn't been that at all in book one. Um, and, and I mean, I understand his motivation, but I feel like um, we don't sympathize with him at all by the end. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess, it, again, I, I always try and see both sides to things. Um, and... If I were in his shoes and Jay just totally out of character took off and went to this place where he made it clear to me he really kind of didn't want to be every other time he had been there and then sends me a note when I know he can't even read and write, I'm going to question if who he's with made him do that. Did he get brainwashed in some way, shape, way, shape or form and it's probably going to cause me to act really, really fucking stupid, quite honestly. I mean, if, if I have to put myself in his shoes and try and, like, think about what I would do, I, I can't even... I, 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 yeah, I'd be a psychopath. I mean, I already am. Well, no well ways, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I guess let's talk about the, the climax in general. So, first, um, they arrive at uh, Highburn, um, and... It's a little confusing because Highburn is both the name of the place, but also the name of the king of Highburn. King, yeah. Okay, so I, I, they, they arrive at the place, uh, and the cauldron is there, and then uh, Jurian is revealed to be alive, and it felt like, okay, this entire book, they've been building up, uh, Jurian might get resurrected, what's going to happen if that happens? And then it's revealed, Jurian's resurrected, and he's just like, basically the king's sidekick. 
Yeah. And yeah. So I'm, I, I guess I'm still a little underwhelmed or I'm not sure if that's going to be expanded on more. In, It'll be expanded on more. There's, that's not all there is to it, yeah. Because um, I, I definitely want to know more about Jurian, but what we got, it just felt for so much buildup, the payoff wasn't quite there. Um, yeah. So then that happens then. Oh, Tamlin's there, and for a moment it seems, oh, Tamlin's just gone evil now. Um, then the two sisters are dragged out and, uh, I guess, baptized by Cauldron is maybe the, the best way to put it. That, that was what you had texted me when you got to that part. You're like, shit, Nesta and, and uh, Elaine just got cauldron baptized. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm curious because I think I said this last time that uh, Nesta and Elaine did, really didn't do that much in book one. And in book two, the, the first half did a, a good job uh, implying there was going to be more to them or having them appear briefly. But I feel like now, uh, when, when this, this baptism happened, that's when uh, shit hit the fan, shit hit the cauldron. Yeah. <laughs> it went all over. <laughs> it was just a mess in that throne room. <laughs> um, and then we get this, uh, uh, I, I don't know, added climax of uh, Lucian is Elaine's mate. Um, and I don't even know what to, what to say about that because that... I almost want to, I'm sorry, wait, pause for a second. I almost want to insert that meme I sent you with a cat. Lucian, you're my mate and it's this cat that's like, oh, and that's, that's like... I bet that's going to pop up on screen right about now. And Q. Uh, so, no, anyway, but I, I, yeah, I mean, I was, I, that, I didn't see that coming. I was like, wait, what? Like, and, and there's been a thing in the fandom, right? Where like how that when mates are talked about, it's this rare thing. It doesn't happen all the time. And people are like, Sarah J. Mass is just like, and you get a mate? Yeah. You get a mate? And you <laughs> well, that's one of those things. Like, again, I'm curious to see the payoff in book three, because it's, it's something that, uh, if done badly, it makes the world feel smaller when this is supposed yes. to be such an epic world with so many characters and vistas, but it's, oh no, our, our small circle of main characters are all interconnected or mated in some way. Now, what, I'm, what I am going to say, though, is, and she kind of laid the groundwork for this with, um, was it Talman's parents, too, or was it just Reese's? I can't remember, but like how, just because... Your 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 mates with somebody doesn't mean you're a good match. Doesn't mm. mean you have to choose. Doesn't mean you have to choose them. It's not what it means at all. Like you can go your own separate way and choose who you want to choose. It's not like she didn't make it where like you have to be with that person, which I I appreciate because you still have choice. It's not like your choice is taken away from you. It's it's so. She did lay the groundwork for that, at least, because it was Reese. I think he said his parents weren't like his dad was horrible, his mother was great and stuff, but like, you know, they were mates. Um, and it just, but it doesn't mean that they should have been married necessarily. So, um, so all all of this is a way of saying like, um, uh, I enjoyed the the ultimate climax of book two, but it's. It, it feels like the story's not over yet, and so I got to get to book three. Yes, um, I think that, I, I don't know, sometimes, um, and this, this series wasn't even Mass's debut. Right. I mean, that was Throne of Glass. So she could, she could have, like, ended the first book on a cliffhanger if she wanted, but I feel like a lot of authors, I'm guilty of this too. I did it in two of my series. Um, end that second book on... Like that cliffhanger where like what is good, like nothing, like some of the stuff got resolved, but you can't consider it a standalone book. You have to go get the third one to finish the conclusion to the story that started in two. Yeah, I, I feel like that's a kind of um, like the classic structure with a lot of trilogies. I mean, that Star Wars, that's, um, yeah. uh, you haven't read it, but the Mistborn trilogy does that too. Um, like book one feels like it sets things up, but it could be a standalone book two ends yep. on a definite cliffhanger. And then book three feels like the payoff. Yes. Now what I will say that I absolutely appreciate with mass that she did excellently. And with this series is that, 
um, when you do plan a trilogy, right? So, you know, just one book, you have to have that arc, right? We have the rising action, right. the climax, and then a little fall, and it evens out. That's the structure, a, a, a typical story structure. When you have a trilogy, you have to do that throughout the trilogy, okay? And there's a certain order to it. Now, I, I actually just started reading another series. I really liked the first book. I'm not going to mention the series or the author because I'm going to do a little bit of bad math in here. And I don't want to, mm. like, you know, taint anybody's opinion. But first book, really great, okay? if it Slow start, but really good. Second book, it was filler. There was maybe 60 pages yeah. that you absolutely had to have to get to book three. Just put, just make book three bigger. Yeah. Like, I don't need a whole book of filler to, to get to make it a, just make it a duology. Yeah. I don't need a trilogy. But it's like these authors got offered a trilogy deal and they're like, can you get three books out of it? And they were like, yeah, sure. But it's like, no, like there's planning involved in this. You can't just, there needs to be this structure. And Mass did that with this. This was not filler. In any way, shape, or form. No, I would agree yeah, with that. We, like, for all the things I'm saying about Akamath, I didn't feel anything in it was filler. No, it, it kept moving. And we're, again, like, this was the, this was the setup for the rest of the series. This book. Um, where, I can't tell you how many series I've read, where, like, the second book, you could throw it away. Yeah. Just give me, like, the Cliff's Notes for it, and I can get to book three where all the shit really goes down. Um so I do appreciate the fact that, like, you know, sh she was on her game with this one. You know, she was thinking ahead, like, okay, I have, you know, this is what's coming up next. And this is what I need to lay the groundwork for. Um, now, you had asked me, I think, in our last video, which of these books was my favorite. And I said it's this one. Um, it's still, as of right now, this book. Um, I loved everything about and i hate slow burns you guys i know everybody loves a slow burn i do I like a slow is. burn when the payoff is worth it i'm okay with it throughout a book if you oh yes, mess yes. With me and 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 it's a, so, several books like carrie read a series where the car the slow burn four books yeah four no no i'm done i can't like don't like to me and i don't know if it's just because like my background of like writing and plotting and stuff like like to me that's the author just going well now you have to buy the next book because they're still not together really no i don't now actually i'm not buying it on purpose <laughs> like, no there, there's a book series i also won't say the the title but i i remember th there was one book that had a chapter where the characters went to a specific location and i went oh that was really cool and then nothing happened what, what was the point of that you could have just cut that out and the the, yeah. the fans online said oh no 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 like that that's important for a later book and then in the next book, in, like, the climax, like, the last, like, 16, 17 pages, you got the payoff to that. And I was like, okay, well, I barely remember what happened in the previous book. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, uh, geez, okay. Um, but, yeah, no, I actually really loved this slow burn, and I think it was because um, we got to know them as friends, like, they were cute and bantering with each other, and he was always the one to say, you can do this. Like, you don't have to, but I'm telling you, you can do this. Um, and I really enjoyed it. So, like, when, after, you know, they went to the Court of Nightmares, and which I told you that was hot. Did I? Mm -hmm. I did not. Yeah. That, that was yes. hot, was it not? <laughs> okay. Um so that that if for anybody following our videos, that was the the scene I was alluding to. That I was like, it's not even a love scene, and that was just like fire. I was like, oh my god. Um, but like after they get through that, and then we have like you know they fight a bit, and then there's Starfall and stuff. Um, I was so on board. I'm like, are these two. I don't care if they're mates. I don't like just they need to get together. Um, so then like when we get to when he gets hurt, and uh, you know she goes to the serial to get the answers to how to, you know, cure him from the poison and whatnot. And the series is like, oh, well, the, you know, the, your blood will heal him. Like a mate's blood will heal. And, and, and I was like, I kept reading and I, it didn't hit me until the line where it hit Feyre. I was like, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes. But it 
was still. Yeah. Because she waited so long. It, and it never really got mentioned again, like the whole mate thing that I was like, oh, I just blew it out of proportion. Like it, it's not, that's not true. But then I, it, 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 I was surprised, even though I was one of the people who thought right back at the end of book one, like this is what's where it's going because she held off so long on it. I was surprised. So I loved all of that. I loved the whole sequence of them getting the book of breathing. Yes. That was awesome. Like everything flooding and then. Then the, the book, like, talking to them, and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, it's creepy. Uh, so that's another thing. I wonder if in book three all of these little separate MacGuffins are going to play a bigger role. Yes. Yeah. I mean, she. You, I have to say, I, I got to give it to, to Mass. Like, she kind of, she's like Reese. She really doesn't do much without a reason. You know what I mean? Oh, like, nice. There's something in there. Um so, yeah, and, and that's something, too, I think a lot of uh, readers forget is that, like, you know, they're like, which character are you the most like? And it's like, they're all me. Yeah. Like, in one way, shape, yeah. or form, or another, like, I may have enhanced the character traits and stuff, but, like, um, you know, Gabaldon, going back to Outland, my Outlander author in an interview, fans had won, like, a lunch with her. And they were sitting down and talking, and they heard bad character like her villain is somebody black jack randall the guy's just deplorable like a disgusting human being mm. and um one of the fans said oh my god could you imagine like having lunch with black jack and gabaldon's like i just sat back and sipped my tea and thought but you are <laughs> <laughs> i mean everything came from her head yeah. it's you know so i will say that about mass so she is yes yeah, like she definitely you can tell that she planned this trilogy i mean maybe she didn't go crazy at first and wrote it and then went back and added things because i know she had years to like you know do it but it definitely she yeah she's she's all she was awesome with this so a lot of those things will come back around now i will say um, um with reese um what I liked so much about him in book one was he was very morally ambiguous, and there was a little bit of that at the start of this book. I feel that kind of went away as the book went on um, to now he's uh, he, he's a hundred percent the character you root for. Absolutely, um, and I think I had said this in our last video. I kind of mourned that a little bit. Um, because he was really interesting, right? Like, yeah. but then you find out that's it's all a mask. It's just a front. Like underneath, he is this really, really good person who will sacrifice himself and anything as long as it keeps the people he cares about safe. He'll do whatever it takes. Um, and it, it's just you know, you do root for him, but I kind of miss. The asshole yeah. too. <laughs> and was it you who told me that Mass had originally planned for this book to have a dual POV? No. Oh, no. Okay. I, no. Okay, because I, I guess the way it felt is um, it, the whole book's told from Feyre's POV except for the next to last chapter. Yeah. And that was a little jarring when it happened. Me too. I, yeah, I, I absolutely... It was the same thing for me. And I mean, I was like, what is this? Why are we getting like... His, his now, not that I wasn't happy to be inside his head, but it was kind of like, wait, what? Um, I almost feel like it would have worked better as the very last chapter mm -hmm. as like a, a little add on, especially because um, book two starts and it's his POV again, 500 years you mean book three? in the war. Uh, book three, yeah. yeah, starts and it's his POV and it's 500 years prior when he's in the war. Um, and I was kind of like, okay, like, is this something we're going to keep getting? Are we going to keep getting his POV? I, but like, we don't. I guess I wondered if maybe Mass started writing it as a dual POV at some point, realized, no, this isn't working. I'll make it all Feyre. But then she left that last, those last two chapters that way. Uh, and it was like a, a remnant of that first draft. That was how it felt to me. It might have been, um, you know, I do know that, like, the advice is that if you are going to do dual POV, like, it's hard to do dual POV. Yeah. It's hard to pull it off. Um, but there's reasons for it. Uh, like, if you're going to have the two characters be separated for a, for a long period of time where there is important plot shit 
going down that we need. Important plot <laughs> shit. Both of them. Yeah. Okay. That's a term. Look it up. No. <laughs> So, but seriously, like if, like, so that this way we don't have those scenes where, you know, this one was off doing this and here's our POV character and they have to come back and they regurgitate it all. Right. To, no, we don't have that. We've got, we get it. We get it through this person and then we get it through that person. Um, also, it works really well in romances. Yes. Because we get the internal feelings from both of them, even if they're in the same place, at, you know, so those are the reasons, but you, you don't have to have it be half and half. You don't need to do that. But you need to have enough of the other POV to... You can't... Like, right. My friend, my friend Carrie wanted to do this with her one novel. She's like, I think I want just like a chapter or two from the other guy. I'm like, no. It doesn't work like that. Like, at least not for a debut author. Like, you can't... There's just things you can't do. She's Sarah J. Mass. If she wants to have just a chapter from one of their points of view, she can now, I will say this, though. In the novella, uh, Before Silver Flames, we have Reese's POV, we have Feyre's, we have Cassian's, we have Nesta's, we might even have Moore's. So we have multiples in that little novella. And I don't know if maybe this was the setup to kind of get us to go, hey, just a heads up, you're going to get other POVs here. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what her thinking is. Um, it almost makes me want to Google and see if there's been an interview with her explaining why. Yeah, we have this one chapter at the end of book two that's from his point of view. And from what I remember in book three, I, I think there's, I think there's only the opening chapter that's his POV. We don't get it again. And if we do, it might be one or two more times. I'm thinking in um, Stephen King's It, where you have seven main characters, you kind of have seven POVs um, that uh, in that book. But I feel like you had to do that because otherwise having seven main characters, it's so easy for them to get lost in the shuffle. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And because um, the way he structures that book, it'll be... Uh, at the beginning, this is Bill's chapter, this is Eddie's chapter, this is Beverly's chapter. And then as the book goes on and you get more comfortable, it'll it'll be one chapter where he jumps between the seven. Gotcha. And okay. until, you know, like by the end, you feel comfortable in any of the seven's heads. And I, I feel like that, that was necessary for that book where you had a core group at the center. And also it's it, yeah. it's a long book, so it works in that book's favor. I can definitely see how that would have worked. Um, I do know that, like, there is such a thing as too many POVs. Um, it's something that, like, you know, if you read craft books and stuff, you, you, you need to, like, he's Stephen King. Yeah. He can do whatever he wants. And he's going to make it work because he's just that good. Um, but, like, if somebody went out um, and tried to get an agent with a book that had seven POVs, you're going to have so much editing to do because you're going to have to cut like three of them minimum. It just doesn't, it's, it doesn't work. Why? Because normally he can't pull off seven really individual POVs. Not only that, but did you write a story that truly warrants seven, seven different points of view? Like probably not. Again, Stephen King's a freaking genius. He did yeah. write a book that you needed that. You had to have it to get this connection with them. I completely understand that. But yeah, like, no, that's... So you guys, anybody who's out there who, like, wants to... Don't write a book with seven Yeah, movies. agreed. I, I don't, don't write one, really, if you want to get an agent and, you know, get... What, probably more than three. I mean, and just a heads up, because there, like, a lot of people argue about this. I'm going to tell you now, Gabe knows... I don't talk out of my ass when it comes to yeah. writing because I don't appreciate when people do that to me. You can only have one protagonist. Yes. So as many points of view as you have, you don't, only one of them is a protagonist because I see people in the writing groups go, well, my two protagonists, no, mm -hmm. pick one. <laughs> Whoever's journey is the biggest, whoever has the most character arc, like by the time the book is done, that's your protagonist. Nobody else. Or, or um, who is the most active character, hence proactive? <laughs> yeah, if it's more of a book like, because um, not every book or story is um, 
you know, about an inner change. It should be. Um, those usually tend to be the really good ones. But, like, let's take Indiana Jones, for example, right? Mm -hmm. He's the same character throughout. He doesn't have this big character arc. He may learn some things and his eyes get opened a little bit, but he's still the same as when he started. Those characters work really well in, like, an action-driven plot well, because we don't need this big change what i was gonna say uh sometimes uh, it gets called the flat arc character like um mary poppins who she's the same throughout but the characters around her grow and have arcs exactly. but because of her exactly exactly so yeah in a story like that 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 is that you know that's your protagonist um n normally again if you're it's the one who has the most growth the one who starts at point A at the beginning of the book and then at, is at point Z by the end of the book. They're a different person. They had this journey that they went through. So just keep that in mind, you guys, if you are writing multiple POVs, look for, like Gabe just said, either the character that impacts the others the most or the one who has that big change by the end of the book they're not the same as when they started uh um, and i know shannon's not as big a fan of back to the future as other people but um that's a case do you know how many times i've gotten biffed in this <laughs> house okay. um so there marty is the protagonist but uh you could argue it's his father george who uh has the biggest arc but because of marty's actions yes yeah but i mean marty changes too though Mm. Marty's, you know, he he changes. He's not the, he's not the same exact person as when we started. Okay, the traits of him are the same. You know what I okay. mean? But he had his own little journey too. But I do agree with you. Yes, it, the journey wasn't as big. Okay, so I absolutely I do agree with you there. Um, no, I've been forced to watch <laughs> Back to the Future with Jay. So just and I like time travel movies. This just wasn't one of the ones that did it for me. <laughs> he actually just said that uh was it yesterday or the day before we we're out of the blue we're sitting here watching tv that's how i met your mother and he's like oh do you know what today is no what's today he's like it's the exact date that marty went to in the future okay <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> saw it somewhere online and I whatever made him think of it but I was like cool <laughs> like I don't fucking know what to say to that <laughs> so anyway um but yeah I don't know I don't know what the deal is with that that little thrown in yeah POV there not that I didn't like it I did like it it's just but I felt the same exact way as you I was like where did this come from um so <laughs> I, I guess um, that that really is all I have to say about Akamath. I, I do like it, but my thoughts on it were pretty compact and not as nuanced. So do you have any questions for me? Um, I'm trying to think here now. Okay, any thoughts on like... Well, all right, what did you think about how like at the end there in the throne room, Feyre did that 180 where like... Tamlin? Tamlin? Oh my god, it's that was great. I was like, oh, you sneaky bitch. Oh, you bitch. Like, you're gonna do this. You're really gonna, like, she's going in there, man, and she is gonna be a viper. Like... Th that was fun, and then, you know, we know right away that she is gonna be a spy, so... Um, I, I think because it's told from Feyre's POV, we, we kinda know what's going on. We didn't really fall for it. Now... I did there for a minute, like really genuine. I was like, oh my God, he, like the king is breaking the bond. Not just the deal. I, like that's what it turns out to be, right? It was that like deal that her mm -hmm. and Reese made at the end of one. But I was like, oh my God, like how are they going to get the mating bond back? What is going on with my life right now? Like that's what I was worried about. For me, because I am character driven and I'm emotionally invested. Yeah. I liked all the big action sequences because I also like action stuff. But, like, it's those moments where, like, I'm like, no, 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 you can't do this to me. Please don't do this to me. Please don't do this to me because how this is this is going to kill me. And so then I was very happy. And then, oh, and then the reveal at the end that she's not just his mate. She is high lady. Yes. 
Well, and there has never been a high lady. Uh, which I think will have uh, a nice satisfaction at the end of book three. Or maybe before the end. It definitely will. Um, there's a couple of scenes that I have to say I am um, that stuck with me after reading book three that I am looking forward to. Um, that was that one. I remember I was like, man, we're back at the spring court. Like, fuck this place, <laughs> right? But it was so different this yeah. time around because, like, she's one thing. Like, oh yeah, Tomlin, <laughs> love you. I'm gonna fucking stab you in the back, you fucking cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> so it was I I still went into I was like I went into book three and I was like man just get out of the spring court but then like because of all the shit that does like happen in the spring court I was like well this is kind of cool like okay I'm all right with you being here because like this is this is okay so um it wasn't I think I'm going to enjoy it even more this time around Whereas with the beginning of book two this time around, I was like, can we just please get the fuck out of spring court? Can we just like, can we, can we get yeah. this on the, like the show on the road? Um, but I think I'm going to enjoy the beginning of book three even more than I did the last time. Uh, especially cause I know like where it's <clears throat> going and whatnot. So, um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I really wanted to ask you. I don't know. I think that's it. Um, I forgot to say I got distracted with my cup, you with your butter beer mug, but I have my Valar shirt on. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love it. I love it. So I'm, I'm to the stars who listen and the dreams that are answered. I, I know everybody likes that quote, but I really do love it. So and that was a nice, um, nice moment in the book. A nice world building. So yeah, yeah, enjoyed I really that. like Starfall. Like when they do the uh, Hulu show, I will definitely be. Like th that whole starfall scene will be interesting to see how they do it. And it's not just like stars, it's supposedly souls on a journey to somewhere else. Um, and I, I just liked everything about that. I thought it was really interesting. It was a nice moment between them because they had been fighting previously. Um, and I also, there that that moment when they actually before that when they were fighting and stuff he's like you don't think i know how this story gets written like i'm the villain and she was like no but the villain's the one who locks the girl away and i just loved that little like yeah. moment too because you could see that like he tries to make like he doesn't care like i'll do what i what i do as long as everybody's safe but like it was clear that he does care he doesn't like the fact that he's got to be this asshole to everybody else um and that's what they think of him so anyway we will get to see what do we go to i think it's the dawn court in book three so we'll see that but there's like a high lord meeting so mm. we'll get to meet all of the other high lords and like their consorts and stuff and um that that's a good i remember that scene that was that was really interesting and good so um there's a lot to look forward to in three i think if I have to make a prediction for which book you're going to like the most, I think it's probably going to be three, but there's a caveat to that. I think you're probably going to have the same exact issue with the ending that I did. Still think you're going to like that book the best, but I think you're going to have an issue with the end. Okay. You're, you're hyping that up. So I don't know how I feel. <laughs> You'll see. I think I, my predictions are usually wrong, but that's my prediction. Um, all right, you guys. So thank you for joining us in our little ramble again. Um, and we will get back on here when we get to book three. We'll probably split it into two parts like we did with this one. He's got his butter beer. I've got my Atlantis cup. Yes. So, cheers. On that note, <laughs> hmm, delightful. It's a nice coffee. Um, thank you for joining us. And stay tuned because we will be back with ACA War. Is that really the and acronym? ACA War? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A Court of Wings and Ruin. Okay. I hadn't looked at the title. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, wait, wait. Yeah. No, I wonder if she chose, she chose that title on, perfect, on purpose just to have that acronym. 
I don't know, because it is a good acronym, yeah. especially for like, well, you know, everything that we're building up for. I mean, you know, it's she. I think she made it pretty clear in book two that like by the end of it anyway, because Feyre fucked up and put the book together, um, that like there's not going to be any, there's no way to resolve this peacefully. There's going to be a war. Like the, the, that's good. It's bound to happen. So yeah, it was a great acronym for that book. Um, yeah, you guys will be back then. Um, actually I forgot to mention in the beginning, but please check it out. Uh, I'm going to put a link to Gabe's page. Go and subscribe to him, please. Uh, I'm going to put a link to Gabe's, the trailer for his film. Go check it out. Like it, please. Um, and yeah, subscribe, hit the like button, click the little notification button if you want to be notified for when we do the next one. But until then, this is me signing off. Gabe. And this is Gabe saying, uh, I hope you enjoyed Cauldron Talk. Yes, and we will see you on the next episode of Cauldron Talk. Till then. Have a wonderful time. We're, we'll be having a wonderful time reading book three. All right. <laughs> All right Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.